Wins uh, from last time. So we had a, a similar session a month ago talking about Offshore Wind 101, sort of generics. This time we're uh, delving a bit deeper into the environmental aspects. We have the amazing Alison Lane, amazing. who is our super environmental expert and will be <laughs> able to answer most of the questions that you know, were directed at me last time, but I'm not an environmental expert, so I, I know when to stop talking. <laughs> Um, so yeah, for those of you who weren't here last time, I'm Giacomo Caleffi, I'm the manager for Taranaki Offshore Partnership, which is a joint venture of the New Zealand Superfund, which you might have heard of, and uh, uh, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners. So what we're looking at is, is the feasibility of building large uh, offshore wind farms off the coast of uh, New Zealand. So these are, you know, like onshore wind farms, but built offshore. We build much bigger turbines. They harness a lot more energy. Uh, they are big projects and they require a lot of, you know, community engagement. We basically want to make sure that we are doing the, the journey with the community. We're looking at, you know, we are years ahead of anything getting decided. So uh, construction for this, if it goes ahead, would be early in the 2030s. So 2032, 33, something like that. So there's plenty of time to, again, discuss these issues before they become issues. So discuss them as they are uh, topics. Kia ora. Um, and that's what we're here to do uh, right now. So uh, very early on, we wanted to open the space so the community could have a place where to come and, and you know, ask questions. We're starting off with these monthly sessions, which we hope give a bit of a feel for what we're talking about. But I'm sure there will be a lot more in the future as we understand what people want to understand. So I will stop blabbering and leave it with Alison, <laughs> who I think is perfectly equipped to do everything. Well, hopefully, we'll and see. We'll see if I can make this technology <laughs> work. So, um, kia ora uh, oh, I'm terrible at this. Um, so, yeah, nā mai haru mai, ko Alison Lane, tōku ingo. So I am just one of the environmental folk who will end up working on this project over time. Um, so Giacomo is saying I know everything. <laughs> Don't believe a word that he says for that. I know some things, um, but really my role is to actually help to pull together all of the people, all of the environmental specialists who will be feeding into this process. Um, I will be able to give you some answers, but really a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is really actually the journey that we're going to go on okay. um, in terms of identifying what the environmental issues are and how we're going to manage them. Kia ora. Um, so, without further ado, I will check if my technology is working. So, and, and just my background, I'm, uh, I'm a marine environmental specialist. I've got about 22 years of working in impact assessment, um, really focusing on the marine environment. So. Uh, I've worked with a whole range of, I've also worked in sort of government policy roles, but with a whole range of different types of infrastructure, transport, ports, I do a lot of work with Port Taranaki. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of my background and, and in this role I'm really acting as a bit of a project manager, I guess, to pull together a whole bunch of specialists. So obviously the first thing that everyone says when you talk about doing something like building an offshore wind farm is well, what's the environmental impacts of that? Like, so we're really conscious that, you know, that's, that's a real starting point for our questions as well, um, you know, as to, you know, are the, what are the effects and are they actually going to be acceptable and can they be adequately mitigated? And we know that this is going to be a really key issue for the community um, and for Tangata Whanua. And, you know, I mean, this is, and it's, the, it's a key issue for us as well, which is why we're kind of starting this journey super early. And we're starting the conversations with people super early, particularly local people who are going to be the ones who are going to have a lot of information that we need because we do not have all the answers yet. So yes, yeah, so what I'm going to talk about tonight, it's going to be the sort of the, some of those really key environmental considerations that we're going to look at, what the process is that we go through to try and assess those impacts. What we've been doing so far up until now, because we actually started work in this space probably around the middle of last year, so we've already done a bit of work, um, and, and what the next steps are in this kind of very long journey, as Giacomo pointed out. Um, so obviously the key environmental questions, they sort of come down to really what, where and how, like most questions. So the first thing we really need to know what's out there. 
Um, and in environmental impact speak, we call these receptors. So, you know, it's all of the species, it's all of the environmental features, and that's, that includes social. So when I say environment, I'm, I'm talking people as well as, you know, fish and birds, and, and I'm talking everything from tiny planktonic organisms through to things right at the top of the food chain and how all of those connect with each other. We don't look at anything in isolation because, let's face it, the environment doesn't work like that. So we want to know what's out there and what the habitats are, you know, how those species are using that area. Um, it's not just, well, there's, you know, there's certain species of fish, but how are those fish <coughs> using that area? And, and how is that then going to interact with the, whatever infrastructure gets put out there and how it gets used, how it gets serviced, how it gets looked after, etc. So, so this is the really big questions for us. What's out there? How are people using this environment? You know, where is the Mahinga Kai areas? Where is the sort of, you know, the other sort of commercial fisheries activities? Just people walking along the beach, you know, doing their thing. Um, so, and then also how sensitive are these environments? So you might get things that are there that are actually not very sensitive to disturbance. And so a pretty good example of that would be something like, you know, plankton, so bottom of the food chain. Um, yes, they're kind of sensitive in that they're fragile, but they're also so widespread and they have super quick reproductive rates that, you know, something that takes out, you know, some, Plankton is not going to have a big ecosystem impact compared to something that's got a really long generation time, like let's go right to the top of the scale and say a blue whale, um, you know, it lives for 100 years and, and is really slow to reproduce. So obviously, you know, that's a big impact, one versus a, a thousand, you know, it, it matters. Um, and then we look at, yeah, what are the interactions? And, and what effects might generate from those interactions and how we can avoid and reduce and mitigate those. So, you know, and interactions might be direct. So, you know, a super direct interaction would be we put a pylon on the seabed and that little bit of seabed has got whatever, it's got crabs, it's got shellfish, it's got things living, it's got little worms living there. They're gonna be directly affected. But then you also, you're gonna put a pylon in and you're gonna generate a sediment plume as part of that process. And that might affect fish further downstream. So that's what we would call an indirect impact. And then you've got other things that maybe sort of coexist, but actually there won't be a real interaction. So another example, if we stick with our, we're putting a pylon on the seabed, the impact on the seabed is unlikely to affect a seabird. Even though they're kind of in the same geographic area, there's, there's not that interaction, although they're occupying the same space. So that's, when we talk about direct and indirect impacts, that's the kind of stuff that we're really interested in. So you can see it's actually pretty complicated. Um, the picture just up there for reference, that's just showing, that's a map of sort of intensity of commercial fishing activity. Um, and then obviously the picture down the bottom is a bird, just in case anyone <laughs> hadn't noticed. Um, so we're not we're kind of starting from scratch. So these projects have been around for a long time. Um, and, you know, quite large offshore wind projects have been around for a good 20 years now. And every single project is an opportunity for learning and there's a lot of study that goes into these and it's increasing, I guess, with every project. Um, and every project is trying to learn off each other. And you've got some really long-term data sets now, particularly in Europe and, and the UK, um, where a lot of the research is kind of funded by government as well and driven by government. So there's very coordinated data collection. Um, so, so that's great, and we can take a huge amount from that, but we can't just go, oh, yeah, cool, we know what's happening in the UK, so we know what's going to happen here, because we all know this is a really unique place. We've got unique species. We don't have puffins. I really wish we had puffins. I really wish we had puffins. But we don't. We've got penguins who, you know, operate, you know, they've got a fairly similar ecological niche, but they're quite, you know, they're quite they're quite unique and we've got you know maybe yes some of our birds some of our marine mammals some of our fish they've kind of got parallels with overseas species but we've got unique water temperatures we've got currents we've got isolation from really big industrial 
you know, pollution discharges. So our ecosystem is our ecosystem. And while we will take what learnings we can from international experience, we're not going to assume that that's going to answer all our questions because we need to really focus on what's here and how it all hangs together as part of the big picture. So, yeah, there's just some statistics on, you know, the fact that there's sort of, in Europe, there's over 6,000 turbines in place already compared to approximately 70 that are being proposed here. There's 129 wind farms in 30 countries, 13 countries, sorry. So, yeah, so there, there is a lot there that we can take lessons from, which is great, but it's only a starting point. Um, so the sort of very first steps that the project took, and this was before I got involved with it, was this constraints mapping exercise, which was just looking around New Zealand and going, what's some of, you know, what are some areas where maybe potentially this activity could occur? And so it looked at some of the logistic stuff, like some really fundamental things, like, uh, is there wind? Um, yes, no, okay, well, we're pretty sure South Taranaki's got a buttload of that. Um, but things like the ocean conditions, are there protected areas, are there other industries that are happening in the area? You know, can it be connected to the grid? Have we got any kind of proximity to a port that could be developed to be suitable for this? So all of that logistic stuff. But it also looked at some of those and mapped out some of that sort of big picture environmental stuff at a really coarse level. But, you know, are there protected areas? Is, is there a lot of fisheries activity? Is there a shipping route going smack bang through the middle of the site? All that kind of things got looked at as part of that process. The next step, and this is where I got involved, is to try and actually really focus in on the environmental issues. And so for that, we set up this thing called a technical working group and we pulled together a bunch of people. So we had local people, we had some really specialist scientists, um, you know, seabird experts, marine mammal experts, fisheries experts. So we pulled all those people together in the room. Um, there's also representation from Taranaki Regional Council's marine team and from Department of Conservation because they're obviously super interested in this. Um, and the idea of that group was really to talk about, okay, what do we know? What don't we know? What are our big questions and what are our priorities? So that group met a couple of times. We had sort of two full day workshops and then we also had a whole heap of correspondence. Um, and the idea of that group is to try and kind of pull together some of the right people to start really going, these are our questions. These are the things we need to answer. And yeah, your locals? sorry. Your um, so the Taranaki Regional Council people obviously were very local. Um, and then we also had Graham and Nicole from yep. from Natiranui. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There. <coughs> Graham Young. Graham yep. Young. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just add to what Alison was saying that, you know, this study, this technical working group that we put together is not the end of the story oh, at all. It's, it's just the beginning, the beginning of the story. So it yeah. was the, f the very first step towards starting to think about these issues. So, you know, uh, the community, where does the community enter the picture? For example, here, that's, that's why we're here talking about these things, because over the years, over the next few years, there will be a lot of conversations where the community can can you know raise their voice about what they think should be uh, looked at more than other things. So yeah. absolutely. And that invitation as well to join that group did go out to more iwi and hapu, but people were kind of a bit hesitant. They didn't know enough about the project. Yeah. So there were some people who said, yeah, interested, but we'll talk to you later. So yeah, but it, like, as Giacomo says, it was very much a starting point. Yeah, we've been talking to Project Reef a bit, yeah, and we're talking a lot to people from Wild for Taranaki as well. So I'll talk about some of the community stuff, but now that's one thing I wanted to say too. This is really informal, so stop me and ask me questions at any stage. So what sort of cultural impact uh, lens do you have over your current situation or, or research? Uh, there will be definitely, like I'll, I'll, we're right at the beginning of this journey, but we're definitely going to work as closely 
as they will let us with hapu to look at like what sorts of studies we need to do, how we should do them, what involvement they want to have with those, what are the key, you know, sort of cultural tile kind of things that we need to really be focusing on. Um, so, you know, we're talking, we've got years between now and when we're even going to get anywhere near putting an application in, assuming that this is seen as being the right path to take. And so, yeah, iwi and hapu, are definitely, we need them along on that journey. What's years? Two to three, three to five? Uh, before we're looking at final investment decision, which is basically when we've gathered all the information that allows from an invest investment point of view to say we go ahead, we're looking at the end of the decade, so 2030. Okay. So plenty of time to, you know, voice. Yeah. And in terms, ju just to add to Alison, so we've, yeah, for the last year and a half, we've been so talking to... essentially the beginning of any kind of build. Uh, the build would then happen in solo 2032, 2031, 2032, so yeah. And in the last 18 months, yeah, we've been having, uh, so we've been talking quite closely to the, e the four iwi of South Taranaki, which at the beginning we were sort of, you know, we were told those will be your main uh, starting, you know, where the conversation needs to start. And now we're starting to understand a bit better where we need to go to the hapu level, for example, with Narwahine. Uh, you know, we've, it's been pointed out to us that it's obviously a more hapu-centric uh, iwi. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a long journey because it's a lot of people. But uh, the idea is that, you know, eventually it's not only iwi, and Hapu that we talk to, it's, it's individuals, it's the individual people in, in South Taranaki. So that's the long-term mm. plan. How yep. much are you going to disturb the sea beef by drilling way down? Because, see, you've got opposition to sea beef mining, which I yeah. disagree with. I think they both should go ahead. I think mean, this is great. I don't know what you make around there, just do it. <laughs> how are you going to handle the opposition to sea beef disturbing disturb when you've already had opposition in another yeah, so I'll talk, I mean, I'll talk a bit in detail about some of the impacts. Um, I mean, the scale of the disturbance is obviously very different to something like seabed mining, where you're dredging, essentially, a large area of the seabed. This will be piling, and then with some sort of, you know, rock armour around the base of the piles. Um, there is, we have got a figure somewhere, which I haven't got in this presentation, which talks about, you know, the actual physical footprint of that area. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll bring it up after the presentation. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, well yeah, def but definitely, I mean, we're expecting opposition. I'm, I'm not thinking, I'm not under any illusions that everyone's going to go, sweet, great, go ahead, do it. You know what I mean? And, and it's up to us to, to actually verify, well, for me, as a marine scientist, you know, I want to verify for myself that this is okay too. And this will be you know, global so because you'll have the central government pushing oh. it because it's global warming, climate change stuff. Yeah, you politics. Know, still going to get pushed back for disturbing the CD. Yeah, 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 and it will be a long process. Do you know what I mean? Where we actually have to make sure we're comfortable that whatever effects are can be mitigated, and everyone else has to come along, you know, with that journey as well. So, and the impacts on around like um, um, movements from the for earthquakes and all that. Is that part of your research as well? Oh, that would be an engine. There'd be a heap of engineering studies into the stability of the area. Yeah, but this is not drilling like this is not drilling like oil and gas drilling. We're not drilling kilometres into the seabed. No, if this will you be quite shallow. To actually put the, um, what, those wind uh, wind things yeah. into the ground and go to the ground level. Yeah. What impact does that actually have if the movement of the land? Because oh, I see. Because it's around volcanic movement that's for Taranaki. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is that actually going to have a, a short term or a long term effect in terms of your wind farm? I'll let the engineer answer that question. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's an impact. And yeah. If we don't look at that mitigation and what that looks like. That actually could have a, a, a long-term effect. Yeah. So the, yeah. The, the structures themselves w will not be able to have any, um, even though they're planted into the seabed, will not affect uh, earthquakes in, in any way. The very different uh, magnitude of size. So, but will they be affected by it? That is one of the studies that we're doing now. Yeah, th they will be. I mean, uh, it, the one good thing with these structures is that they're really flexible and they are very. Uh, 
not on the same frequency of the normal earthquakes. So you can think that the earthquake will shake quite quickly and the structure respond quite flexibly. And that's the best thing that you can have for a structure in terms of making it resist earthquakes. But in terms of the structures, guys, I think this question came up last time, whether the structures could you know, induce earthquakes or things like that. Uh, no, I can say that as a engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Any engineering questions? I'm just gonna. Yeah, I'll actually move to the front. So real quick. It's a bit easy. We'll just talk about the maintenance of that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the gonna be. The system actually has to, is an ongoing system. Yes. No matter what you put in the lab. Oh yeah, this is definitely. There's gonna be a lot of maintenance. So yeah, if anyone yeah. wants to put their hand up for maintenance jobs, <laughs> Jack and I will take names at the end of the presentation. Yeah, yeah it will be yeah. plenty. Yeah. I'm going to talk about birds on a later slide. Can we can we focus in on birds then? Is that okay? Cool with that. All right. So um, so kind of stepping, taking a step back before we get into the detail about things like birds. Obviously, what we're looking at is some of the sort of really key environmental receptors. Um, so people, you know, we're all part of the environment. Um, and these are just the things we're focusing on initially. So there will be other more detailed studies into a whole range of things, but you know, we've got to start somewhere. So this is, this is the stuff the technical working group came up with is, hey, this has kind of got to be our starting point, and then the other studies can build off some of this. So yeah, so benthic habitat, so that's obviously actually a really big question. You know, things like reefs, sandy seabeds, all of the stuff that lives in them and on them. Um, seabirds and shorebirds, yes, they're a biggie. They're probably going to be one of the most controversial aspects, I would say, of the project. Um, things like primary producers, so that's our plankton um, and fish. Um, coastal processes, you know, anything that affects current or wave moving, movement, we're interested in making sure that that's not going to impact on coastal processes on the shore. And then marine mammals. So those are the sort of things that we started off talking about. And I'm pretty sure my next slide is going to get more into the birdies. Um, oh, and then, yeah, the other thing I mentioned, it's like, is there an interaction? So we looked at the different phases of the project. Um, so from construction, and these are just the really big ticket items, things like, you know, obviously there'll be noise, there's going to be boats moving around, there's going to be disturbance of the seabed. Then operations and maintenance, that's, you know, and that's long term, like how many years are we talking? 30 years. Yeah, 30 years. Um, so, you know, where there's going to be people coming and going in boats to look after the turbines, there will be some noise, although it'll be really different sorts of noise. There'll be, you know, a visual impact potentially. There's the turbine blades, you know, which seabirds again, that's going to be a thing. Um, they occupy space on the seabed that could be being used for other purposes. And they will change the habitat. So, you know, in some ways they will create habitat, but they're going to change it. So change is change. We're not making judgments here about these interactions, whether they're good or bad, or these just are things that we would call interactions. And then there's decommissioning stuff. Now, at this stage in the work, we haven't gone into a heap of detail on that, but there certainly will be. Um, and there will be before there's any kind of approval process go through for the project, it will need to be considered in depth. But initially we focused on those first two areas, partly because decommissioning is kind of reverse of the construction. In, so a lot of the same sorts of activities would be happening with boats and noise and, and so forth. Um, so that's kind of where, that's the things that we looked at initially. And, and this is just like a crazy mind map of how we would say, OK, how do these things interact? So, you know, changes to the seabed, it could affect coastal processes, it could affect fish, it's going to affect the seabed itself, it's going to affect people. So, you know, we kind of draw these crazy maps and go, OK, hmm, OK, where's these things intersecting? Where do they overlap? And that's without even getting into the whole next batch of crazy intersections between these things and each other. So this is just like the first steps. Birds. Here we go. We can talk about birds now. So, um, so yeah, the thing about birds and any of our species, and this is where the uniqueness of our species comes in, 
is that it really depends on the behaviour. So, you know, seabirds are definitely not all alike. They've got incredibly different behaviours. Some fly skimming over the sea, sea surface, super close to the sea surface and using the lift from the ocean. So they're kind of flying really down here. You've got other species that are flying really high, say if they're migrating over an area. You've got species that will be flying mid-height or fluctuating in their flight height regularly. It's also how do they use the area? Is it an area that they feed in? If so, how do they feed? Are they just skimming and picking fish off the surface or are they diving birds? Are they just using the area for resting? You know, you'll often see, I've done survey work out in the South Taranaki Bight and you'll sometimes you'll get quite big sort of, you know, flotillas of some seabirds that are really just kind of chilling out on the water surface. Um, what's their flight routes? You know, where are they flying to and from? If it's a shorebird, how are they getting here? And where are they coming from and where are they going to? So all of those things are really, really important questions that we need to answer before we can start to really pin down how much risk is going to be posed to any of these species. So it's definitely, and, and then you've got the other things like you've got the migratory species, we've got um, the issues with, you know, we've got Ramsar sites in New Zealand, so we've got wetlands of international importance. Um, quite apart from the fact that obviously we need to really preserve those sites and the species that are visiting them are vulnerable because they're travelling from a really long way away to get to them or, you know, and those sites are super important to them. Um, there's also, this is all overlain with a whole lot of international conventions that New Zealand is party to for the protection of different bird species and their habitats. So seabirds are going to be a really big one that we're concerned about, we know there's going to be a lot of concern about and we're going to be studying in a huge amount of depth. Now, we will have seabird specialists working very closely on this and that work is already sort of kicking off now with a multi-group study that includes Department of Conservation and other developers as well are funding, mm -hmm. aren't they? Mm -hmm. To start to identify which species are most sensitive and what those areas of sensitivity are. So, did you want to ask your seabird question? Um, well, after looking at all the other countries, like Australia, Brazil, well, you know, these turbines have been out since 1887, and they were built by James Bright in Scotland. So, when I had come last time, I asked Jack what, what were some of the things that we needed to look at in regards to these turbines. Looking at some of these countries, they lose hundreds of thousands of migration birds. To me, that's a concern because they brutalise our land. They yeah. brutalise the water for our fish and all that sort of stuff. That is a huge impact. Already, they're taking out hundreds of thousands of bats. Yeah. Birds that are flying into these. I mean, they're not taking out one or two, they're taking out hundreds of thousands because they, they, they fly as a flock. Yeah, yeah, I'd be interested to see, because the references I've seen haven't shown those kind of numbers. So if you can, I'll give you my contact details. And if any information you can share, that if you're coming across references. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we will definitely, seabirds is something that, and you know, I mean, any, any application is going to have to demonstrate that any effects are acceptable. That's for sure. So yeah. we have enough evidence to say from 1887 right up to today, that's the impact it has on birds. There's enough evidence there to say how many get killed per year. Yeah. That's true. It's, uh, again, though, it's going to depend where you are and what birds are there. And so if you're, say, some of the North Sea sites, they might have very large flocks of migratory birds. So, yeah. But we are a lot smaller. So yeah. Thousands, we're not going to have much left. We don't have as many birds as all these other big countries. I would really hope we're not going to kill hundreds mm. of thousands I'll, of people. I'll add to that. That's absolutely a legitimate concern and it's one of yeah. the main things that gets uh, discussed with seabirds and the interaction with turbines. The numbers of birds that get killed by buildings, yep. cars and cats is like, I think, a 10,000 times more than the turbines. So it's one of those things where, you know, the number is impressive. It's important that we study it, but it's, it's not like in the grand scheme of things, it's one of those impacts that we are already impacting those species in many other ways by just existing as humans. So it's one of those things where we have to be a little bit you know, cautious about 
we're still talking about something that is supposed to you know fight climate change and i'm thinking that climate change can, kills a lot more bird, birds than that yeah in the long and run. i've got i've got a, a something about that but i guess we can touch on that now is i mean obviously you know an impact on even an individual bird is uncool like you know nobody wants to kill a seabird but I'm sure that most of you would have seen the recent media stuff on the fate of the emperor penguins in Antarctica, you know, because of the sea ice melt. Basically, they're saying, you know, 50 years, this species could be extinct. So this is something, I guess, that has to be weighed up. So yes, an individual bird or even, you know, a number of birds is definitely a concern. But if you're looking at potential complete collapse of a population because their food source has disappeared because the oceans have got too warm, then do you know what I mean? Like, there's sort of a little bit of a way up that's going to have to happen there. And I mean, it's not for me to make that decision. My job as an environmental scientist is to help to pull together all of the data without putting my personal opinion on it. So, you know, it's like, what's the data telling us? What are the effects? And then other people who are probably wiser than me are the ones who will be making that decision about are those effects acceptable? What's the, what's the scale telling us here? So, but I mean, definitely seabirds are a legitimate concern. Yeah, because we've got to remember that they are part of the I'm going to skip past that one. We may see you here right there, bodily fluids come out of the ship, but it's not actually fertilised for our lands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why people go to the farm and for their gardens and, and collect them. They yeah. Yeah. People make to see a bird is not just a bird. Cool. And because Maori people are very cultural and they intertwine with everything, everything living is what we connect to. Yeah. And they're living. Yes. So that's where we would, the concern will be for us. You take away our birds, you take away some of our marine life. Take our marine life away, you take away our food source. You take away our food source, you're taking all us away. Yeah. Yeah, and it's all connected. And this is something I think that, you know, as I said before, you know, right from the beginning, we've really, we're going to take a, a, you know, a whole big picture approach to this. We're not just looking at an individual species. We're looking at how that species interacts with everything. Um, I'm going to move on through the presentation because um, otherwise we'll run out of time. Mm -hmm. I'm sure people have But plenty of time for questions afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll drink tea and then you can... Yep. You can we can talk specific. So um, the next step was this sort of literature review. So we, like I said, we kind of targeted what some of the things we're really interested in at, as this starting point. So we sent all the scientists away and said, go and find every scrap of literature you can lay your hands on that is already existing that will help to give us a starting point. So, you know, that's things like it's government databases, Department of Conservation, fisheries, historic records, um, you know, community work that's been done. Project Reef's a really great example where we, you know, there was information that we could pull from work that has been done by that project. The Waverley sawmills will tell you a bit anyway, won't they, about birds? Sorry? The Waverley saw, uh, um, windmills. Are yeah, so windmills. anywhere where there's been other projects that have already started to gather data. So that we're pulling all of that together. So basically, in this initial, it took a couple of months and we're, people looking at, you know, doctoral theses from university students, like anything basically they could get hold of to try and say, okay, well, what do we know so far as a starting point? So yeah, so we looked at a lot of information as that. Um, there was over 220, I don't know if I already said that, over 220 documents that were unearthed one way or another that were pulled into this. But what it also allowed us to do was a gap analysis. So we went, okay, well, here's what we have, but actually, where's the gaps? And there's a lot of gaps. Like, I won't lie, there is a lot of gaps that need to be filled. I am going to be very busy <laughs> trying to get the right experts together to help fill these. So, so that thing, what we came up with is this big list of gaps that we're going, oh, this is, yeah, we need to know about that, and we need to know about that, and we need to know about that. And well, though we need to know about that, and that's really important. And then what's a whole list of different ways we could gather those, those data? How could we start to fill all of those gaps? And, you know, that was sort of from everything from interviewing local people, getting out 
hooking in with community surveys that are already happening to full-blown huge scientific studies that are going to cost Copenhagen and the project very large sums of money. Um, so, you know, this is just pictures of a few examples of some of the things we might be looking at. Seabird tagging and tracking, baited underwater cameras, diver surveys or, you know, camera surveys of one sort or another, plankton toes, seabed bathymetry surveys, underwater cameras, eDNA, everything. We just, everything got thrown into the melting pot as here's a whole list of things that we can start to look at. Um, and I don't expect you to read detail, but for each of the studies, we then also looked at how well will this fill the gap? Will it fill all? Will it fill some? What other studies are going to be needed? What's the use by date of the data? Because there's no point us studying something tomorrow if that information is going to be just useless in, you know, in three or five years. Um, we need to time when studies are done. How long does the study need to be done for? how much involvement, because we're really interested in working with the community, you know, how much involvement can the community have in these things? Can they have, you know, technical input into the ideas? Can they help us with the execution? Is it going to create jobs? Is it going to create manufacturing opportunities for local businesses to help us get this kit together, that kind of thing? So we went through that process. And now we're at the sort of next steps. And the next steps for us, we're not in a position to start these huge studies. And because of the use by date for some of this information, there would be no point because we could do them and then we're just going to have to start all over again and it's not going to help. Um, and also, obviously, there's a heap of investment decisions that need to be made as to whether the, you know, each time they decide, is this project proceeding? Is it proceeding? Is it proceeding? Before the literally millions and millions of dollars that are going to be required for some of these big studies can be spent. Um, as Giacomo mentioned, you know, they're investing other people's money, our super funds, uh, you know, <laughs> on the line here, damn it. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, this matters. So, but what we can do is we can start to do some small scale stuff to help us to really target those bigger studies when, when they happen. So, so any work that we can do, and we're looking for opportunities to start any of that work that we can that will help us. Good plan. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, help us to then direct our efforts so that we get the best bang for buck, I guess. Um, so some of the things we're looking at already, putting out some hydrophones on the seabed. Um, and initially, it'll just be a couple, but it, later on, there will be heaps. So we need to know where to put them and what species to tune them to, because they'll pick up different frequencies of different species. Um, things like working with some of the community groups. So there's uh, the Greyfaced Petrol Trust is interested in doing some tagging studies on birds. So is that something that we could potentially assist them with or help to fund really you know, kick-ass trackers that will give us good satellite data, which the project might not otherwise have been able to afford. Um, so things like that. So, you know, we're really interested to hear about any community studies that are going on that people might be willing to work with us on that we can say, hey, is there a way that we can help get this work done? And that will then also help us when we start spending our millions of megabucks, you know, Jack's going pale here. Um, <laughs> maybe I hadn't broken the millions of megabucks to him before. But, you I'm know, like myself, help us so. to make sure that we're spending that in the right direction and we're getting the most information that we can. And the other thing we're starting, I mentioned the seabird sensitivity analysis work that's beginning, but also we're, st we're, we're continuing to design what's the best surveys, looking at new technologies that might be coming out all the time that will help to answer these questions. So that's kind of, that's what we're planning on at the moment. And then I think, as I mentioned, you know, obviously community involvement is really important to the project. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And one of them I'm going to be really blunt and upfront about. As a marine scientist, you know, I've worked on a whole range of projects. And I know, and probably I've been guilty of it myself, it's really hard to trust science that has been paid for by someone who wants to do something. You know, the community, your immediate gut reaction is, 
they're just going to tell you whatever you want to hear. They're going to say whatever you want to hear. And I mean, people like me can stand here till the cows come home and say that my integrity matters more to me than the money from one client. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to throw my life's work and my career away just to make one client happy. But still, the community's not going to see it that way. You know, I'm getting paid to do a job. That's, that's what's going to get seen. So for me, as well as I just want to involve the community, because I think that's a really cool thing to do, and this is your place, you know, this is the place that you stand. This is your environment as well as mine. I mean, I'm from Omata, so, you know, I'm local too. But as well as having that partnership approach, it also hopefully will help people will be able to see the process and trust the process and go, yeah, we worked with those scientists. We helped to design those studies. We saw what they were doing and what they've put in these documents is is what they saw, you know what I mean? So it's, so I think it's two-way street. I think there's huge benefit for the project. There's also benefit for the community. Um, and let's face it, you know, this local knowledge is gold. You know, there's stuff in there that's not written in any publication. You know, talk to someone's auntie who has stories from three generations ago and, and she's gonna tell you where the seabirds used to nest and what they do and you know how they use the area or the, talk to the local fishing guys and they're going to tell you where the good fishing spots are and where the reefs are now we've already identified we know there's some really good reef areas out there but they're not mapped they're in people's heads and you know what i mean like there's no point us just trying to make it up we need we need that information if we're to make sure that what we do and how we do it is being done in the most environmentally sensitive way that it can be done and that the impacts are being mitigated. So yeah, so for me, those things are hugely important. And you know, if you know of any cool in community projects or you've got an idea for one, let us know because we wanna, you know, we wanna work with you if we can. And particularly if it's something that's got a conservation spin off so some of the work that, you know, we're talking to Wild for Taranaki about these projects, yes, they've got good information gathering, but they're also gathering information that can then be used to benefit a species. So that's great if that can be done. So obviously, you know, if, if this all continues down this path, there's gonna to have to be big impact assessment. You guys have probably seen them. They're, you know, about yay thick, these massive, oh, I pressed the wrong button. Ah, what have I done? Um, yeah, so, you know, I mean, there'd be consent applications. They have to be supported by an awful lot of environmental information and impact assessments, which are gonna be scrutinized by regulators and the regulators, inter, you know, peer reviewers and boards of inquiries, and there'll be public notification and there'll be hearings and you know this this is a process you guys are probably all very familiar with it after successfully telling TTR where to get off um, so you know there'll be there's going to be a lot of stuff that goes into this process and a lot of opportunities for everyone to look at what the project says are the impacts and how they're going to mitigate them and decide whether they think that's okay or not so this is just the very beginning of this journey. Um, mitigation. So there is already, like as, as I talked about some of the international experience, and every bit of international work that's being done and every new project is coming up with new ideas and new ways to try and minimise impacts. And we're watching every single one of those very closely to see what we can learn from it and what would be applicable to this environment. So things like, Underwater noise, when they're putting in the piles, they use these double air curtains. So basically it's just generating a heap of bubbles. And what that does is it stops the noise propagation or it certainly limits the noise propagation through the, through the ocean. Um, you know, they're doing a heap of experimentation with different ways to make blades visible to birds. Um, there's also, you know, radars on turbines that slow down or stop the turbines when birds are approaching them. There's a whole heap of stuff that's happening that will have to be looked at. They're starting to look at recyclable materials because obviously historically you couldn't recycle the blades and that was not great. Um, 
there's other stuff I've seen where they're looking at options for just how to, they're using what they've learned from looking at turtle shells to texture the pylons to reduce how much scour happens around mm. the pylon, which then reduces how much scour protection you've got to put in. So like I say, there's a lot of work happening in that space. Um, is getting the attention that it deserves and hopefully by the time this project is anywhere near that stage there'll be even more. What's scour? Scour is like where you've got, uh, if you think about, if you stick a rock in the ocean and every time a wave goes around it's going to accelerate the current oh. around that rock and it's going to take sand away. So it's, yeah, mm. yeah, if you stand on the sure. wet sand. But yeah, it's obviously we don't want the turbines getting scoured out and falling over. Bad look. Bad. <laughs> We'll have none of that. Um, and then obviously it's not all it's not all bad, it's not all impacts, not all change is necessarily harmful, but change is change, so you need to consider that. But um, you know, there's an artificial reef effect, uh, which you know potentially actually is beneficial where you're gonna get a habitat that fish can breed and then spread out into other areas. Um, there's things like, although there would be, fishing is likely to be okay around the turbines, obviously something like um, dredging is not gonna be okay if there's a cable there. But so if you've got areas that are protected from some of those forms of fishing, then you may actually see an enhancement mm -hmm. of a fishery. Um, yeah, tr trawling would, n would not be allowed inside the wind farm yeah uh, but more re recreational fishing that that would be fine it's just a matter of there's cables running in between the turbines obviously you don't want anything that is scouring the seabed because they risk yeah the snagging onto the cable yeah so yeah so things like that um yeah and then obviously and, and we've mentioned this already you know climate change i think everyone is pretty much on the page that the effects on the marine environment and most wildlife are not going to be great um, we're already seeing some real horror stories even in our backyard um, it's accelerating so there has to be that balance there between you know getting renewable energy and you know harm versus overall benefit. So all of those are really big questions um, that people can philosophise about over a cup of tea. So, and that's it, that's oh. my presentation. That is my picture. <laughs> Yeah, if there are questions about the project in general, because some of the people here were not here last. So a month ago, we did a presentation on more offshore wind in general. Um, I gave that, that presentation, so I, you're very happy to take questions on what is offshore wind, what we're talking about here, and all that kind of stuff, if you have any. And it can be done over a cup of tea. If you... um, question, well, actually, information. Now, there is scientific evidence to suggest that offshore wind turbines can cause major damage. Now, there was some studies done from 1999 right up to 2000. That organization, well, that group, the institution, there were two of them. One was Woods Hole Oceanic, you know, you know who they yeah, are? Yeah, yes, yeah, that was one of them. And the other one was National Oceanic and uh, Oceanic and Atmosphere Administration. Yeah, no. Yep. That is evidence that it can cause major damage. Um, the other thing was, because a lot of the marine animals like dolphins and whales and all that, they use the sonic to yeah, communicate sound. with each yeah. other. So these wind turbines can interfere with that communication. So that was another thing that was actually seen in those studies. Yeah. That to me is another concern. So that's the evidence that we're looking for. Yeah, How there'll be underwater noise, there'll be damage. a lot of underwater yeah. noise studies got that will need got to be done. Rain. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So those are all the things that we want to Test study. for us, yeah, study for ourselves so that we have our own answer. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's another thing that's a species specific thing. So, you know, underwater noise is a really interesting one because you've got different species have really different hearing thresholds. So dolphins, they hear much higher frequencies, for example, than something like a baleen whale, like a, a southern right whale or a blue whale or whatever, which hears really low frequencies. So different types of noise will affect different species in different ways. So there's like, 
I'm not giving you the answers here today. I'm saying we've got a really big list of things to study and look at what the potential impacts are. And underwater noise will definitely be one of them, and obviously birds. I think I brought it up last time in regards to, the, to where the turbines are going to be, um, which is going to be sort of in a, like a square. Mm -hmm. In that area, because you've got lines running through, pipes running through, electricals running through, you're going to cause some sort of electric magnetic field. Mm. I think I spoke to you about that. Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Were you able to provide me a little bit more information in regards to that? Oh, that'll be, that's, that'll be another thing that's going to get studied. Obviously, like, like we need to identify what species are there first, and then we can go, okay, well, there's species there. Which of those species are sensitive to electromagnetic radiation? Which ones are less? According to, according to the studies, it will affect all Yeah, it will, that will get covered off. It's going to affect the whole lot, no matter what vibration they are. Yeah. That's my concern. Mm. But there's will, there's a lot of studies that say the opposite of that. So, you yeah. know, what, what we really need to do is to make sure that we're looking at all the evidence. Um, and then we want to make go out and, and find our own evidence. When I say our own, I mean for New Zealand, not, not Taranaki offshore partnerships. So whatever we study needs to come out with an objective view of what the impacts could be. Um, you know, and, and, and then we will have the information to make the decisions. That's the idea. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. We're yeah. just the new kid on the block, okay? So we knew pretty new to everybody else. Yeah. They are our evidence. Mm. Yeah, there's the, but they as are as our mm. ones that did it before us. So we should be learning some of the lessons that we are getting from them of what will happen yep. when you bring them here. We definitely yep. will so be. Yeah, yeah. There's huge evidence out there. I only mentioned two of the institutes that do it, but there is plenty more. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of evidence to the to the opposite, though. That's that's the thing. There's a, a yeah, lot of evidence. Yeah. There's, that there's been a bunch of studies that have shown no effect. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. That's all the stuff that we gathered with that initial study on, yeah. uh, you know, the environmental constraints. It's different to that's not going to harm any of our environments. I will jump in. I'll be the first one to sign mm. up. <laughs> but as long as you don't put our environment, people and our marine. Yeah. Which I think I've spoken to you before, there is another one. Have any option. any research started so far? Or when will you start the actual research and how long will that research go for for you to actually make an informed decision as to what the impacts and the environmental situation is gonna be at the end of the day? I know yep. you're starting at 2030 mm -hmm. for for the project to uh, hopefully initiate and get sign off. Yep. Um, but that's only what seven years away. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So that's quite a lot of research that you are actually wanting to gather in mm -hmm. a short period of time. I mean, which people think that seven years is, not, is, yeah. is a long time, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's a years short line. Yeah. 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 Mm. So seven years is already here. Yes. I'm not saying it's not here, but yeah. if we want to have more of an informed decision process yep. to actually either support or not support, yep. then I'm just interested to know how soon would that research start yep. so that actually yeah, there's some definitely. information to gather yep. that we can actually use as data to say, well, actually, this is where it's tracking. Yep. Yep. This is what the fish species or the sea or the birds are doing. Yep. Yep. Sooner yeah. rather than later, that's sure. all. Because yeah. yeah, yeah. otherwise, mm -hmm. the government's just going to go along and say, well, we've made a decision because we've read this and we think it's still a good deal. Yep. But it might not necessarily be. Yep, and that's exactly what we're trying to, to avoid. We're trying to make sure that, that you guys have the opportunity to decide whether the evidence that we gathered is, is satisfactory. So as Alison was saying, we are starting with some small-scale studies, uh, as in that uh, hydrophones that Alison was talking, putting a few microphones out in the water, underwater, to, to you know, collect evidence on marine mammals. So all those studies are really expensive, and we are at the moment there are no laws in New Zealand that allow us to build an offshore wind farm. So we are, and that's one of the reasons that we're looking at towards the end of the decade, because we need to go through a very long process of getting consent for things like this. So right now, uh, all the money we're spending on this project is 100% risk, because tomorrow the government could say we're not doing offshore wind, and that's it. 
So as Alison was mentioning, we are actually spending some of, our, I'm a taxpayer as well in New Zealand, and I'm spending my own money for the pension. <laughs> uh, so we have to be very careful about what we do study and what we don't study. So it's a constant balancing of, you know, we, we, we do need all this information, but there's a right moment to start the full campaign. The full environmental campaign for this, we're estimating around $30 million. So I cannot go now out, spend $30 million that might be, you know, useless in the future. So it's, it's that balance of making sure that we study as much as we can. I can assure you we're the ones who are spending the most money already on getting all this data. Uh, but there's a point where we have to be careful about, about how we spend it, obviously. But yeah. hypothetically, if, if, say, you got the green light, yep. um, where about, I'm, I know you're looking at part here, but how far yeah. out to sea would you be and how many uh, wind turbines you're going to be using? Yeah, we're looking at... Uh, from 25 kilometers offshore out to roughly 40. Okay. So, uh, and uh, the number of turbines will be set <coughs> to, to, for the size of project that we're looking so at. So you wouldn't even so be able to see it from the bloody land? You would see them really yeah. tiny on the horizon yeah. in, yeah. on a clear day. You can see them drilling right. You need to squint hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so so why, why so little turbines? Uh, I'm just curious now. S S 70, <laughs> it, it would be the largest power plant in New Zealand. <laughs> These things generate a lot of electricity. One gigawatt, yes, there's no power plant in New Zealand. Uh, Handley is, I think they just, a part of it went offline, so it's now below a gigawatt. But yeah, yeah. Manapuri Dam, it will be the, la the second largest, and I think it's 950 megawatts, so. Just what you had said, it's very expensive. Yeah. That's very essential too. Yeah. It, because it generates a We're not worried about the money. We don't give a damn about the money. Yeah. Okay? It's not about the money. You better push the price of power. You better push and beat right. account more It's about power, the our future generations. Yeah. We don't give a damn about the money. We don't care how much it's going to cost you guys because at the end of the day, <laughs> that's too. what you want to put in there. But we still need to take care of our own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Well, and so these studies will happen, but they can't start until... Until there's a regime, yeah. No. So it can't start until they're already set up. No, 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 no. no. it so can't start like until we, we have re regulations in place that tell us what we need to do to eventually years later get the consent. So, you know, it's still a lot of work. That's why I was saying 2030 is when we feel that we might get to the point of having enough evidence to us ourselves, investors, decide whether we want to invest $5 billion to actually build this. So that's the, the, and you know, that's where we all agree, okay, this is a good, from an environmental perspective, it seems sound, from a commercial perspective, it seems sound, and that's where it goes ahead. But uh, yeah, that's all the environmental study happens before that. That's yeah. when we then decide, okay, we, we know enough about this and the impacts, there will be impacts. You know, if you're asking me, will, don't kill any seabird, not one seabird, then I, I have to leave, then I have to close down shop. <laughs> but again, the reality yeah. is that m m the cars driving around yes. do that. So we have to kind of balance w what is it that we're trying to achieve, you know. Yeah. Because so some of those, oh, to answer your question, um, the first hydrophones are looking to go out this summer, ideally, yeah, aren't yeah. they? So Hopefully. the pilot, you know, I talked about where we can, we're going to do pilot studies. Mm -hmm. So things like the initial hydrophone studies, they might well happen this coming summer um, if they can be built in time and there's a weather window to get them out there. Um, things like some of these community-led projects, which are already, you know, they're already in the wind and they will help to des design studies. So things like... Um, you know, things like the seabird tagging, that potentially could happen in the next year. Um, so yeah, wherever there's an opportunity that we can go, oh yeah, we can, we can do something at least that will help then to build these big studies, which are gonna take years to do. You know, none of them really are less than a year's worth of data collection and a lot of them will be considerably more. Um, so yeah, it's going to be very, very long-term studies and lots of opportunities to collaborate with the community about what we're finding, you know, what we're learning, what the concerns are, how we go about mitigating those impacts to an acceptable level. So all of that will continue to happen long before any even consent application went in. And then even when the consent application does go in, as, as I said, it will be public process so the public will be able to jump up and down then and go, no, nah, you haven't done enough, that's not okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You mentioned, um, Jackie mentioned the fire over here. 
that there were going to be 70 windmills. I think I brought up the last one as well. These guys only last for 25 to 35 years. Mm -hmm. So I'll be 80 or I won't be here. So my mokos are going to have to fix this mess. Okay, that's what I'm seeing. Now they only last for 25 to 35 years, so who's going to fix the mess? Okay, okay. You may not even be here. Yeah. I might put a little pause well, in your... That's part of the actual thing yeah. that talked about. They've talked about decommission. Yep. So it's already been told, it's covered. Oh, there will be a decommissioning plan. Like, oh, yeah, part yeah, of an yeah. application would have to have a plan yes. for how it will get removed yeah. Yeah. and who will do that. And it's so huge. Yeah. Where are they going to go? But, but why would also, we be considering a decommission process if we think that this is going to be a long term solution for a renewable source? Because um, I don't things that can happen at the end is either repowering so re reusing the same structure but putting a new turbine on the turbine after 30 30 years so it's just the top it's, a turbine. it's, it's yeah. the top uh, but also the foundation so it, it's kind of figuring out whether the foundation has enough life left that you can put a new turbine on top or it could be decommissioning as in take everything out 30 years from now we'll have a very different turbine technology from today and we will be building you know, a new wind farm with a lot more efficient turbines or things like that by then it, it, it could it could yeah. cost less but but can I can I also say can I also say in general I think the idea is that if we go ahead with a project like this it's because we decide it's not a mess that we're leaving it's because we decided <laughs> that we're leaving something good to our grandchildren you know I think it was um, some of the studies that had been shown had shown some of the countries where two bikes were put up and they were not maintained at all yeah yeah, yeah. that's that's and that's it, the kind of thing that we they didn't clean up anything in fact there's still fallen blades all over their land yeah. but that's yeah. not going to happen here yeah that's like, not what we <laughs> this is not the we world we live in here in new zealand our lessons from what's been before us though yeah. oh definitely yeah. 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 yeah 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 so what we don't want to do here of the other world Absolutely. And this new generation of recyclable blades is exactly because it's, it was obvious to everyone that we're trying to build a sustainable industry and all of a sudden you're left with landfills full of, of blades, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's exactly the kind of thing that we cannot keep doing. Say again, sorry? They're currently made out of fiberglass? They are, yeah, yeah. Uh, and carbon fiber, I think. And the two main manufacturers of offshore wind turbines have now both developed ways to recycle the blades, which basically means they found a way to melt the resin that keeps the fiberglass together, and then you're, you're left with the, the kind of same components that you had at the beginning, and you can reuse it for another blade or for other things. Oh, so okay. that was sort of the last big kind of sustainability issue that was connected to these, because most of the rest of the turbine is fully recyclable, it's all steel, yeah. can be remelted and reused. The blades were one of the last things that needed sorting, and now we're getting there. So again, it's one of those things where, you know, was the industry perfect 100% from day one? No, it's like every human industry, we started with the best we could do, and then we, we fix it over time. But it's certainly, be an industry, it's certainly an industry that has always been really, uh, you know, concerned about being sustainable, because that was all what it, what, what it was all about. Um, so, and, and certainly there will be a lot of progress. You know, in 10 years' time, we'll probably be looking at what we're doing now Think, oh, we could have done it better, but we will have, we will be getting there. So that's the idea. I do understand that some of these are actually built for the purpose of providing more energy to New Zealand for these smart cities that are going to be built in our country, which is understandable because Black Rock's behind it. Love that they're going to pay at least two billion of this five billion. And I don't know. The other Black Rock has nothing to do with this project. I know everybody yeah, thinks so. Lots to do with it. Even China does. Um, so what I'm. Um, even China does people. So what I'm looking at, even though I'm against what I see, there is another option, which does not hurt our marine and it does not hurt our migration of birds. Mm. Um, you know, that technology we're talking about, it's a very early stages and cannot provide Absolutely, anything close to this. Yeah, but again, we have to decide what, this is a real technology that can really generate electricity. Uh, no, no, it's about it's so about actually being able actually to generate exist, the electricity. Or is it hypothetical? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It's still so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not and I'm I'm not, not saying it shouldn't be studied. Yeah. The no, thing no. with renewable electricity is the answer is that you need to have a lot of different types. So you know, we're not saying that this should replace onshore wind. Yeah. We're not saying it should replace hydro dams. 
all those are important. They all have to play a part. And the technology you were talking about, the thermal ocean, that, that will have to play its part. But by none of these technologies by itself can actually provide the electricity that we need and that we will need in the future. So can I ask an employment uh, question? You sure can. Will there be any training and development done pre to employment mm -hmm. that will be able to create an opportunity for local people to actually Yep, yeah, I'll give a short answer now and then in a month's time I pretend to uh, see you back here because we will be having a session exactly on jobs and opportunities. Oh. Um, so uh, yeah, so um, jobs, uh, these types of projects bring, bring a lot of jobs to regions. It's a lot, a lot more employment that would happen with onshore wind farms, for example. We estimate around 150 people will be required for operations and maintenance for the 30 years of, of life of this turbine, of the, of the wind farm. And uh, you know, a lot of those jobs can be, if we move early enough, can be sort of lo localized, can be South Taranaki based because uh, there's a lot of skills that are already existing here that come from oil and gas, for example, and those transfer quite easily. There's some skills that are not existing, but that we can form. So we, you know, we've been talking with WIT and Polytech and so on, because there, there should be in the next few years a big campaign of getting people trained up for jobs like this so that they can actually apply. In the end, we will have to hire the people who ha can actually do the job, you know, and, but we do have kind of the luxury of time of, of training them. So we did a year long study on uh, job opportunities, sort of looking at what kind of jobs offshore wind brings and what kind of jobs, uh, what kind of skills exist in Taranaki and kind of overlapping the two. Um, the report where we'll release it, I think in October will be fully accessible, but uh, yeah, and we will have the session in, I think it's, I can't remember the date, but sometime in October, having a session here with uh, the people who helped us run the study and they will answer all the you know, questions. Cool. Yeah, yeah, all good. That, that job up there is one of the possible jobs, you know, you need people <laughs> maintaining the blades. Seems like a what's pretty cool. I think it's just maintaining, you oh, need I'm to kind of... Sanding, no, but like, what's, what's the purpose of the sanding? I think you just need to clean up the blades. I mean, they're out there in the middle of the weather. You probably have to just keep them, keep well, them a bit cleaned. The drain, really, don't you, by mm. keeping them smooth. Yeah, so yeah. Sometimes I just realized, I saw a video recently that they actually do repairs on the blade itself. Sometimes, you know, you might have something that hail, I don't know, that, that makes a hole in the blade no, and they actually go out there. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> no birds. <laughs> but uh, yeah, apparently they go out there and they, they patch it up. And... So yeah, things like that. And that's where... And that's where places like Patia uh, play a bit of a role. So we've been the ones who started thinking about Patia. You know, it's a harbor uh, town. Obviously, it had a past where there was commercial shipping going in and out. And uh, yeah, so perfect place to, and it's pretty much opposite the area that we're looking at for the, for the offshore wind farm. So you will be able to have uh, crew transfer vessels stationed in Patia, two or three, we think. Uh, and they will be going in and out from the, from the offshore wind farm. Yeah, that, that would land somewhere along the South Taranaki coast and then we would dial into the, the main trans power lines that run along the south coast. We, we don't know yet where it would be. Again, this is one of the studies, long list of studies that we have to do. Um, and that will also depend on the environmental studies yeah, yeah. because we need to know where all the reefs are and we need to know uh, where, yeah. if cables were coming ashore, where is yeah. the least impact. Least, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Question, how much can we outsource to the other wind farms that already exist? Like for the Electromagnetic radiation and the seabird interactions with migrations. Mm. Surely there's plenty of migrations going on in the North Sea. Oh, there's a lot of North Sea data. Um, Can we use the data and just mm. apply it to the, once we've done the research of what species are out there now? Yeah. Just use their interactions. Uh, it's, it would be nice if it was that simple and it would save us a lot of money. We will be looking at all of that information, so, and, and there is a huge amount being collected for international projects, but like our birds are so unique you know there's like things like the flight heights which is one of the key questions of course so if you've got a bird skimming the surface of the water you know it's unlikely to hit the blades whereas if you've got a bird that flies at 50 meters or 100 meters above sea level then you're you're looking at a much bigger risk so yeah, we're going to have to, we will definitely be learning everything we can from overseas projects, but we're going to have to do things like really, really detailed flight height studies and 
tracking of where birds are migrating to and from to understand what the risks are for our project. It, it's not enough to just go, oh, well, they know this from the North Sea just because it will be so different here and our species are so unique. Yeah. Mm. But the gobbit migration goes to Foxton, right? Right. And Alaska, does that pass directly through this uh, parent again? Yeah, that's something that will have to be looked at. So there'll be certain that sensitivity studies we mentioned. Um, one of the things they'll be looking at, what species are we like going, oh, about, you know, versus species where we go, actually, we don't think that's likely to be a biggie. Um, so if there was something like godwets that we went, well, we're really excited about the godwets, then maybe they'd go into things like doing satellite tracking and going, okay, exactly where are these birds flying? The satellite trackers can also tell you what height they're flying at and how long they take. So, yeah, that sort of thing will have to be done. So, you know, we, I'm not saying we've got the answers now. We definitely don't have the answers. We need to, we're figuring out the questions. <laughs> mm. Just a, a, a comment on, on using other uh, experiences from other countries. Uh, obviously, you can imagine I have to speak to every political party about projects like this because, you know, it's, it's a government will have a big role and we're 10 years means that we'll probably go through three governments. So I need to have support from all parties. Everybody agrees that this is a great idea, but there is one party that I will leave unnamed who said that, oh, it should be really easy. We should take all the information from Europe and it should be easily transferable to New Zealand. And, you know, we're, we're like, we developer, it. it would be very easy for me to say, yes, please do that. But it, that's obviously not the way to go, right? Every, every country has its own ecosystems. Every region has its own ecosystem. So we, for, not for a minute, think that it would be easy. It would be just, an, you know, okay to just take European information. Yeah. But certainly some of the learnings about things, you know, the work that's happening overseas on the mitigation technology is definitely going to be very interesting. And what different species of birds respond to, say, in the way of visual cues. Um, and yeah, they, they do a lot of radar tracking where they're going, they can see certain species of birds, definitely they see the wind farm and they divert around it, right? They're not flying into turbines, they're not being injured. But then we also need to understand, is that having an impact on their normal migration route that could actually be critical in some way? You know what I mean? Is it preventing them getting where they're going or is it making it so much longer for them to get where they're going that we're worried about that extra energy expenditure? So. Yeah, there's there's a lot of the bird stuff will be very detailed. There's going to be mm. some very large documents written about birds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Forklift I territory. Yeah. Let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cheerful thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know of anyone else in are we worried? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. It's, it'll be our turn soon. <laughs> yeah, we've got it quite light so far, haven't we? We've avoided them all. Yeah. Sorry, Jack, but um, yeah, newspapers have actually stated that Black Rock was actually going to fund Tuesday. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but not to this project. Black, BlackRock have been have said that they want to spend two billion. They want to invest two billion dollars in renewable energy projects in New Zealand, but it has nothing to do with us. They're involved with solar. Yeah. But not us. But that's not this particular project. No, no. That's we, not this project. So, yeah. Yeah, no. So the funds behind this. It's, uh, yeah, to be honest, I have no idea what they plan to spend their money on. But, uh, yeah, no, our project. Soon because a lot of these key states are not from here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So Why the... can we not make a New Zealand, our people, the yep. key stakers, so that they get paid what they should for their energy, yep. our energy? Yeah. Because we're getting investors from over making us pay for our own power. Yeah. That is not cool. That is. Doesn't even common sense. So this project is, is the one that has the most New Zealand content because half of it is the New Zealand super fund yeah. and the other half is my company and the reason my company is here is because we know how to build these things and the New Zealand super fund doesn't. Providing, we're manufacturing the, some of these yeah. China actually, yeah, no, we, we, it's one of the, one of the fields where we, we still do not buy anything yeah. from China. A lot of foreigners come in up in the year all over New Zealand, that's very concerning. Mm. 
Well, we are, we are foreigners. I'm, I'm a foreigner coming here to New Zealand and, and, <laughs> and I'm trying to, you know, do my role is to try and make this country a bit better. That's, that's the way I see my role in this country. And my company sees the same. Can you make a buck in the meantime? Yes. But if, you know, if the two things can go, can go together, that's, that's a good way of doing it. If this does go through, I mean, I would like to see New Zealand get the majority of I'd yeah. like to see New Zealand get, actually it's New Zealand's energy, mm. right? yeah. New Zealand's energy, not people who come over here buildings and they get, they, they take the energy and they make us pay for it, that mm. does not sound right at all. Yeah, but when they're putting in the, the expertise or the knowledge of it, they've got to be paid as well. So oh, New, right. New Zealand right. can't That's get all of it, they can't own all. Well, $8,000 just for one, come on. Sorry? And they're going to get trillions out of people paying for the power. Yeah, but that's the government that's and the, 8, like the local bodies that actually have that paid. impact on how they actually sell that power back to us or yeah. to another country. It's like the bottling system. So to me, it's like we don't, I don't think it's that we should be attacking the person oh, no, that's coming no, in to mm. actually mm. determine a renewable source for us. I think it's about us to lobby the politicians to actually stop doing what they're doing with foreign investors. Mm. Sounds like you need a, a session on economics. Which is slightly different. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, the, the super fund is at 50% in this joint venture only because they can't go higher than that. They, they cannot uh, invest, I think, because of their investment rules. They cannot invest more than 50. They cannot have a majority stake in projects of a certain size, I think. Yeah, so that's the, what I'm seeing. I'm seeing other people from other countries come in and building. Yep. Mm. So, and making us pay for our own power. Well, I mean, you, you will you will pay for your own power anyway, yeah. regardless whether we build it or or a New Zealand gen tailor yeah, builds it. Well, and and the and the thing is, see see it this way. We're, we're here at the moment. You have this project, which will be fifty percent built by a foreign company. But after that, there will be the knowledge in the country for a New Zealand company to pop up and build it themselves. Right now, no New Zealand company can do it. So uh, it gives us an opportunity to be proactive. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> New Zealand is to take that opportunity up while we've got it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So uh, yeah, it, it's projects that take a lot of time to kind of learn and set up all the companies that are required, and and they are huge. You know, there's always an element of international uh, effort so required. So Blue Float is one of our competitors and it's nothing to do with us. <laughs> That's another company. That's me. I don't know them. All right, yeah. Oh, yeah, PKW. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, don't know about PKW. Mm. You, you need, need to that crowd expertise fund. from. Could you crowdfund a wind farm? <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> we saved a beach. <laughs> saved a beach. We bought a beach. That's true. We did buy a beach. So we look, a there are some opportunities. The there are some opportunities to get uh, economy, <laughs> local economic benefits, and I think we're trying to do absolutely everything we can to unlock those by doing these job opportunity studies, by looking at Patia as a as a place for so. That's all the stuff that I can do. Uh, can I give you an offshore wind farm fully New Zealand built, uh, where all the revenues go to New Zealand? No, I can't. And nobody can. That's why you, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> well, I was here before the project. I've been in New Zealand way longer than the project. So. Yeah, we'll be talking. We will be talking to everyone. There's a lot of impacts that affect all of this stuff. That's not just here. It's right around the country. It's happening. There's an issue on that part that no matter what any human does, so if we do something, even walking along somewhere, we're going to actually hurt animals. So we, no matter what we do, humans are going to make an impact somewhere. It has to happen. And that's what oh, I'm saying. Actually, <laughs> I, I am sort of not for the wind turbines. 
But there is another option. So I was coming here to, even though I may be present, so we're going to get another option, which I spoke to you about. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a kick? So which one? Oh, the, the thermal. The thermal. The problem is that technology doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's a technology that, that, that doesn't exist, though. So it's, it's one of the things it's that... It's experimental. When it got, if it got to the point where it was demonstrated that it could generate as much electricity as this and it costed less and it impacted less the environment, we would be doing that, that's for sure. But uh, we're not, again, because we're investing our own money, uh, we can't, we don't really invest in research and development projects. We need to invest in things, again, this, these returns go back to us as well. We want to invest in things where we know that if we do build it, we know that it will spin, we know that it will generate electricity, and we know that it will generate a return. So um, unfortunately, it boils down to those, you know, to what, what we can do right now. And maybe in 50 years' time, everything will be different, and we will be using different technologies. If we look at the last 50 years of development, that's certainly what's happened. Um, we're trying to do, I guess, the best that we can with, what we, with the technology that we have right now, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, that technology sounds, sounds really cool. But also, I, 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 should, I would caution you against technologies that have zero impacts. There's no technology that has no impact. You know, every, every structure we put out there uh, has some impact. So it's a matter of making sure that, we, A, we build it in the most environmentally friendly way. And we also want to look at the most minimal impact. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but but again, it doesn't really generate the amounts of power that we that we are talking about. It doesn't generate any power because it's still theoretical at the moment. So. It doesn't actually exist. Yeah, it's just it's a thought like it's cool. theoretical. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a cool theory, and it may be very cool, but yeah. I mean, some other really good ones are wave power, for example. That's, that's another good one. But again, it's not ready. I've, I'm a structural engineer. I've, I've reviewed quite a few wave power devices, and they still need a lot of work to make them actually viable, because they, simply put, they break down after a month, <laughs> any wave power device I've ever seen. And that's because g getting things to work in the sea is hard. It's a harsh environment, as you probably know. They don't hurt no marine or All the cars around here harm the birds just as much as what you're saying, so stop driving cars. Mm. Mm. It's, just, mm. it's as simple as that. You gotta have you gotta you just gotta weigh it up and make sure that it all it all plays out together because you're you're trying to put an extreme context onto one thing, but then we've got another extreme context right here that does the exact same thing that no one's moaning about. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So <clears throat> you have to be very clever in how you want to be talking about this because it all has to weigh up. And yeah. the only thing that we need to weigh up here is the risk management that Copenhagen and partners are doing and everything that they're doing while we're sitting here and talking about. And the best things that are going to have minimal effect or they're going to minimise so that we're still able to do these things that they're mm. talking about. And that's what this talk is about. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the well, language well. we use, like with impact assessment, we use this term <laughs> net environmental benefit, which is where you weigh up. You, you never say, I mean, everything has an impact. Everything we do has an impact. You know, as human beings, yeah. everything we manufacture, all the waste we produce, like, you know, let's face it, we're not great for the planet. But so, as an environmental scientist, what I'm interested in is, is why it's the net benefit. So, you know, for me, renewable energy, yes, renewable energy has impacts. You're manufacturing things, so there's energy goes into that. You're transporting components, there's energy that goes into that. None of that is cool, and we don't have perfect solutions for that stuff yet. But are we going to keep delaying better in terms of renewable energy? for perfect, which doesn't exist yet. You know, yes, if we had perfect, we'd go perfect. Great, that'd be brilliant, but we're not there yet. So we're just gonna keep going, well, we're not gonna go with renewable energy because it, it has downsides 
and then continue to do what we're doing to our poor climate and the species that are actually on the brink of extinction already yep. because of climate change. So, yeah, I mean, yes, there's, and there will be better technologies come along all the time and there'll be investors in those and that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, what, what time is it? Is it 7 p.m.? I think yeah. we're, we're probably around the peak demand of electricity in New Zealand. New Zealand normally peaks around 6, 7 p.m. So right now I can probably tell you, I can guess that the lights are being kept on by all the hydro dams in the South Island running. Um, probably some wind because it's windy, so some of the onshore wind farms. But it's very likely that right now the gas um, turbines in uh, Stratford and Huntley are running to service that peak of electricity that we're demanding this would avoid a lot of that gas being used. So that, that's as simple as it, as it gets. So we would be using a lot more of that wind, which is renewable, zero emissions or anything like that, uh, as opposed to burning gas. So it kind of boils down to that, I, I think. And it's important to kind of remind ourselves that, again, we're doing this because we want to get away from fossil fuels, where if, we, if we're talking about evidence, all the evidence in the world that that is not the way to go, right? That's what we've been doing wrong for the last 150 years. So um, again, I, I agree, this is not perfect. Unfortunately, it will have some impact, but we are trying to do as much as we can to A, understand if the impacts will be small enough that we should do this. And the answer might be no, the answer might be that we don't do it. Uh, and B, if we agree that those impacts are manageable, then we do everything that we can to, to actually you know, do it sustainably. I think that's the spiel. Yeah. Can you talk about the agenda for the 30th? Yes. So uh, the next uh, episode of the series will be on the 30th of October. And yeah, we'll be talking about job opportunities. So by then we will have this report that we've been putting together out. And uh, uh, the company that helped us uh, put together is Concept Consulting, really clever brains from Wellington. Um, and uh, they, they did a super cool study about all the types of jobs that will come. So we'll talk about the types of jobs that are required to service these things, to build them, and then what skills are existing in Taranaki. And then, spoiler, there will be uh, the next steps is where we need to start talking about training because throughout all the study, we identify the areas where there's skills lacking. And so what we will then, probably next year, what we will ask Concept to do is starting to think about what would training look like. Uh, you know, which uh, institutions should provide, because not, not all jobs are like university degrees. There's a lot of sort of, sort of uh, apprenticeship jobs. So what could uh, that kind of, uh, what kind of, the, that kind of training look like? And, uh, and, you know, then there will be a point where, I mean, I'm an offshore wind developer. I'm not a, a training institution. So there will be a point where we, we figure out what, could, what it could look like. And then it should be, you know, politics picking up and, and actually training people. So uh, there, there won't be a... Taranaki Offshore Partnership Academy. Or maybe yes, who knows? <laughs> maybe it will be. And it sounds like you need one on economics from True. some of the questions that have come up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that will be on 30th of October and then 4th of December we'll have the last of this first series. Um, and that will be a talk about community benefits uh, and iwi as well. So I'm hoping to have, I don't know if you know, but um, a lot of the iwi, uh, certainly the ones in Taranaki have uh, in June went over to Europe for a two week trip to look at offshore wind farms. And they came back with a lot of uh, ideas and <laughs> knowledge on the technology at least. So I, uh, yeah, I got from a couple of, um, a couple of them the, the sort of opportunity to come and, come and speak and say a bit what they've seen. You know, the, the story is not settled yet. There's, there's a lot of evidence that we need to provide still and discussions that we need to have with Iwi, Hapu, Fano. And, uh, but at least it's, it's an initial part of the story. And the community benefits pieces, I'm getting actually a colleague from the UK across. She's the, the lead uh, development officer for the UK market. And she works a lot with, with local communities and what kind of benefit programs can be uh, you know, adopted. Because every community was, wants sort of its own benefits. Uh, you know, it can be whatever, sort of setting up training programs could be one. In some cases, it's just cash, like a community just wants <laughs> a certain amount of cash per year to allow the project to go ahead, fine. But I think there's probably more sophisticated ways of you know, finding things that are of interest. For example, p fixing the harbor in Patia or making Patia into a harbor town, you know, that seems like a big benefit. Uh, so that will be on the 4th of December and it will be the last uh, conversation. In the meantime, we are hiring for someone to be in this amazing office uh, because the idea is to have it open sort of three days a week, something like that. Um, I'm based in Wellington, my colleague is based in Wellington, so we try to come up here as often as we can. But we would really like someone based here who, you know, so people can walk in and learn about offshore wind. 
So the idea is that for now it's open sort of once once a month when we do these presentations, but we're looking forward to having someone based here. And I'll, because I'm, I'm just up in Omata, so I'll be able to come down Alison from time might to open time. It. So, so, sorry? In Omata? Yeah, so, so I'm local, so I'll, it's, I can get here reasonably easily. Yeah, so further down the track, this place will be open a lot more than, you know, you might have seen it all closed a lot. <laughs> I tried coming up as much as I could, but... Um, so yeah, and the idea is people will be able to pop in and sort of talk about offshore wind and, you know, what we really want to gather is, is sort of questions, understand what you guys are interested in, and that way I know that that's what we need to go and study, rather than study a bunch of stuff that in the end nobody is interested in. <laughs> we should have some coffee. So is that the type of rig that might actually be on the water wind Correct. installation process? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's... Yeah. Yeah. I, know, I know it's transportable in terms of, because my husband always on the rig. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a jack-up vessel, so it goes to the side and then lifts itself up by the stable platform. Uh, yeah, there's, there's only a handful of those around the world. Um, very expensive to rent, and uh, on a very, they need to be booked many years in advance, and that's one, another of the reasons why you kind of do need that long-term project, because making all the pieces of the puzzle fall into place is tricky. Um, but yeah, they do a good job once it's out there. You pay, you get what you pay the money. <laughs> we should get someone to do a karakia if we're going to have some kai. Yes, true. Can someone do a karakia for the kai? I should learn a karakia, but I you haven't should. yet. Yeah, sorry. Oh, that one's fine. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.